Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, the room seems slightly more empty today than it did on Monday. I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that there was free food on Monday and not today. There's Paul, nothing today? Nothing today, I'm afraid, except knowledge, right? The most nourishing of all. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are and where we're going. We're working our way through, uh, we're working our way through this second section of the course where we've been talking about design. We've had a little bit of an extended pause uh, in the lecture material. We're going to spend a fair bit of time today in lecture material, and in particular in lecture number six, talking about displaying visual information, or uh, as it's else as it's otherwise known, information design. So just to refresh your memory, we've talked about design process, how you go about translating an identified need into a product, which in our case is usually an interactive system. In lectures seven and eight, we're going to talk a fair bit about that design process. We talked about de design philosophy, so different ideas about which particular process is appropriate given the domain that you're designing something for. And in lecture five, uh, you, which I recorded a video of from last year, um, we're we were talking about design principles, so some of the rules of thumb that you're trying to maximize as you go along. And as you'll probably recall, one of the things that makes HCI design specifically interesting and challenging is you're not just trying to create a piece of software that's correct and doesn't crash, but it has these sort of global vague properties, right? Accessibility, uh, what were some of the other uh, non-functional requirements that come up in HCI design? Something should not just be correct, but accessible. Discoverability. Discoverability. Can you find what you're, you're looking for? There's a point in, in lecture five there about remembering versus recall, or recognizing versus recall. What else are we trying to maximize in an HCI product? Affordability. Affordability, accessibility should be engaging, right? It should somehow draw the user in. We're always trying to strike a balance between the objective and the subjective. Is it beautiful? Does it tell a story? Does someone get lost in the system when they're, they're using it in a good way? Okay, so uh, we're going to focus, when we get to lecture six in a moment, on a specific aspect of HCI design, which is designing information. Right? As we all know, we're in the midst of the big data revolution. There's massive amounts of data there all the time. These things are emitting data out into the cloud right now. There's a huge amount of data out there, but how do we find information in that raw data? One approach is to use computers to go find the information in the data, otherwise known as machine learning, and we talked about that quite a bit on Monday. The other approach is to try and visualize the data in some way that humans can discover information or pattern in that data. So I give you a huge mass of data, and you as an HCI designer have to figure out an interface or a way to design an interface to display that data for a particular purpose. Remember, we're always talking about people and activities. So the people in this case are those that are observing the visualization, and their purpose, the thing they're trying to do, is find pattern in the data. How do you present that data in a way that makes that easy for them? It's an actually not a very obvious thing in a lot of cases, but a very creative thing and a very rewarding thing if you get right. That's what we're going to talk about in Lecture 6. Okay, before we get to Lecture 6, uh, deliverables 4 and 5. Hopefully everyone has submitted deliverable 4 and you've moved on to deliverable five. Okay, if you weren't here on Monday, I went through the nitty gritty details of deliverable five. You can go watch that video, which is V10 there, right? Basic idea is you're ripping out the flower data set from deliverable four, and you're gonna be plugging in some gesture data that you generate using your recording software from deliverable three. There's a fair bit of matrix manipulation in Deliverable 5, quite a few steps. Again, I encourage you to get started as soon as possible. Okay, no questions about Deliverable 5? Okay, 
Before we talk about lecture six, just because we didn't actually talk about lecture five in person, I just want to touch on a few aspects of lecture five that I think are particularly important and are going to come up again and again through the rem remainder of the course. We just talked about this, right? We're trying to maximize certain global properties and there are a certain number of design principles we might use, right? We might, for example, want to make sure people can access can access the system, how do we make it learnable? How do we make it relatively easy to figure out how the system works? How do, they, how do we make sure that they remember the system? How do they know whether they're in control? Do they know what they need to do and how to do it? Do they, can they do it in a safe and secure manner and in a way that suits them, right? So in lecture five, I unpack this long compound sentence. I want to focus on just one issue for a moment, which is this issue of visibility, which is trying to make things visible so that you can recognize function rather than not seeing anything on the screen and having to remember everything, right? So once you become an advanced user, hopefully you switch over and start doing everything at the terminal or the command line where you see nothing, but with recall, things are very, very quick, right? But if you're new to a system, you've never used Leap Motion, uh, Leap Motion before, or someone has never used your ASL educational system before, you're going to need to show them something. And although it might not be something they've seen before, it should be familiar somehow and suggest how this system can be used. Right? Okay. Uh, this is a good way to remember the difference between recognition and recall. Um, let's play this game for a moment. How many differences are there between these two <coughs> photographs? You don't need to tell me what they are. Just count them. Who's found four differences? Keep your hand up if you see five differences. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so nine differences so far. Okay, you are relying on recall here. This is why this game is a game. It's hard because you need to saccade or look at a particular point on the left-hand photograph remember what's there, and saccade, move your eyes to the corresponding position in the right-hand photograph, and mentally compare what you saw, what you remember seeing, with what you see when your eyes arrive at that point. Right? If you were wearing eye-tracking software right now, we'd see your eyes saccading back and forth between co-locations in these two photographs. You found nine differences. This is, forcing you, this is forcing recall on you, and this is, again, something you probably don't want to do for your beginning users that are using your system for the first time. You can use other tricks to help them recognize or see things that are there. Same two photographs. How many differences are there in these two, these two cartoons? More than, more than nine. 14. Anyone see more than 14? There's another difference, not just in the cartoons. I didn't actually do this on purpose. I misspelled remembering and didn't, re didn't see it until I played this game on myself, right? The human visual system, and we're going to talk about that when we get to the cognitive psychology part of this course, has evolved to do certain things. One of them is to immediately attend to movement, right? Your eyes are immediately drawn to movement. And here, movement means a localized difference between these images. This super simple trick uh, is used by a number of companies that scan electronics for Trojan horses. So if IBM or another chip manufacturer designs a chip in this country, and they send that design to another country to be manufactured and they get that chip back, are they sure that that chip does not contain a Trojan horse? How would you know? You can actually do this with taking photographs of the hardware itself, opening it up, and playing games between a chip where you know things are correct and a chip where you're not sure that everything is correct. Using the right visualizations, you can do the same thing with software. Again, just a simple trick, but 
changing the way you display information to the observer so that they're not relying on recall. In this case, they're relying on the fact that your eyes saccade to, to movement or recognition. Okay. The other point from lecture five here that I want to focus on is this idea of affordances down here, number four. So how do, how do you recognize functionality in a new system, right? What are you actually looking for? Again, this is kind of a teaser trailer for something we're going to talk about in the cognitive psychology part of this course. When you look around you, Obviously, there is visual information <coughs> falling on your retinas, so what things look like. However, what your brain is really doing is taking what that thing looks like and trying to figure out what affordances is that object advertising, meaning what uses could you put that object to or what kinds of interactions are possible between you and that object. So you go very quickly from vision and geometric properties to function. Same thing when you look at an interface, right? You see an icon you've never seen before. There's Hopefully there's something about that icon or that interactive widget that suggests how it can be used. So here's a simple example of affordances. Um, you obviously know what these five images have in common. It's taken 40 years to get computers to figure out how to see what's common among these five photographs. One of the reasons why it's so different, difficult, obviously, is all five of these things are chairs. You might not qualify this one as a chair, but you can see that it obviously belongs to this group. Why? Why are all the objects in these five images common, similar? You can sit on them, right? So using the language of affordance, you would say that each object in each of these five images affords the interaction of sitting. That's what makes a chair a chair. For 40 years, computer programmers were trying to get computers to recognize chairs and images by saying, if you see an object in the image that has four legs and a flat surface at the top of those four legs, that's a chair, right? There's only one chair in this image that matches that criteria. Okay, if you see something that has four legs and three legs, it's a chair. All right, what about this one? Okay, something that it's very difficult, if you actually think about it, to describe a chair just based on its geometry, right? They come in all different kinds of geometries. They present visually very differently. But for a human observer, it's trivial, right? And the reason why is your brain is somehow doing a translation between what it sees, the geometric properties of the object, and what your brain knows that you could do with that object if it was in front of you in reality. If I were to sit on that object, would it support my weight comfortably or not? That's, that's what you're using to categorize whether what you're looking at is a chair or not. Okay about these four. Also very different. What affordance do these four objects project? Fuel, Fuel right? Or, or an energy source. You'll notice that the right hand one is the same, right? And obviously any one object <coughs> presents lots of different affordances. There are lots of different things you could do with this object. The affordance that rises to the top of your mind has to do with context, right? A lot of stuff in this course is about context, right? What else is going on in what you're seeing or what you're currently doing or what you're interested in? And that will influence what affordance your brain bubbles to the, the top, right? Okay. So we're not interested so much in this class in chairs and fuel sources. Let's look at some interactive systems here. Obviously, they're a little dated at this point, but you get the idea. What do these all objects have in common? Customization. Customization. So what is the, the, so the interaction they afford is customization, perhaps. You can click on them. Okay, that, that's pretty close. The one I was going for is they're cl clickable somehow, right? Most of them, I guess, when you click on them, allow some customization. Again, they all look different. And again, you've probably seen all these, but it, they're, 
if you look at your screen and you open up a new piece of software, a new interactive system, usually there is something about the widgets on the screen which suggests which of them are clickable and which are not. Let's play the same game we just played with uh, the chairs and the fuel sources. So I'm keeping one object in common, but I'm changing the context on you. What affordance do these widgets have in common? You can type stuff, right? So they allow you to enter text, right? Again, it is clickable. This particular tab here is clickable, but it also allows you to enter text somehow, right? So keep that in the back of your mind, this idea of affordances. It's going to come up quite a bit in this course. The idea that when you're looking at the world or you're looking at an interface, you're judging what you see based on functionality. What can you and what, you cannot, what can't you do if you were to interact with that piece of the system? Make sense? Okay. All right. That's all I want to say about Lecture 5. Let's move on to Lecture 6. How do we go about designing an interface to maximize or make it easy, easy for people to see patterns in data? So I've just identified our P and our A, right? Okay. I probably don't even need, we don't, probably don't even need this slide these days. We know about the data deluge, right? We're, we're drowning in, in data. There's lots of different kinds of data out there, and this is where we start thinking about how to design visualizations given the kind of data that we have, right? So we have data that's stored at different spatial and time resolutions. We have subjective data, so all the social network data. I think that he said, that she said, that he felt, and so on. We have objective data, so hard facts that can be somehow verified. Uh, numbers, dates, statistics, and so on. How clean is your data? Right? So when you capture data from the Leap Motion device, it's going to be pretty good, but you've probably noticed by now from time to time the Leap Motion device will hiccup and it will fail to recognize the positions of the bones in your hand. Which parts of the data set can you trust more than others? Uh, after Monday night, we're going to collect all of the data, all of the gesture data from all of you. We're going to have a pretty big data set at that point. Which parts of that data set can we trust more than, than others? I'll give you a hint. Any of the digits that have this in it are going to be a little bit more noisy than things like this and like this. Right? You know about this issue of occlusion now in the Leap Motion device. So don't trust eight or nine too much. I think those are the ones. OK. Uh, conceptual data. So we have data that doesn't have any physical counterpart out there in the world, or there isn't a direct connection between uh, income per capita and something out there in the real world. Some data does have a pretty close physical counterpart, so the number of items uh, in an in in inventory. and more and more these days, metadata, right? Data about data. When and where and who recorded this particular piece of data. Okay. Metadata is what's contributing to the data flood. We have many more devices out there that are collecting data, and we're connect collecting more data about data and collecting metadata about metadata, and you can see how things become <coughs> exponential pretty, pretty quickly. All right. How do we make sense of all the data that's out there? What are some of the main strategies we might use? Well, let's start. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to show this, this video. You can go and watch this URL. This is about the Internet of Things. Everybody knows about the Internet of Things these days. right? We're connecting things to the actual Internet. Hopefully, before not too long, we'll be connecting robots to the Internet. Things, physical objects out there that are collecting data on their own and reporting it back to the, the Internet or the the cloud. If you go watch this URL, it's a short video showing the exponential increase in the total amount of data that we're collecting because of the beginning of the Internet of Things. Okay, so lots of data out there. Let's start with an example of a great visualization. This one's pretty close to home. I think we've already mentioned Professor Dodds and Danforth in the math department. 
This is a figure from one of their uh, research papers a few years ago. This is a visualization that comes from a website called the Pedonometer. One of Professor Dodds is better neologism, neologicisms. Measuring happiness. It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. How do you actually measure happiness? Well, we don't know. But what you can measure, and what you see on the vertical axis here, is affect. So what Professor Dodds and Danforth did with the rest of their students is they got access to the Twitter garden hose, which spits out 10% of all tweets worldwide every day. So we have that garden hose, they have that garden hose. They take each of the tweets out of that garden hose and they look for particular words in those tweets that have affect associated with it. So there was a psychological study done uh, several years ago where they presented subjects with a large number of words and they just asked people, was this a happy, neutral, or sad word? And people would assign a numerical score about how positive or negative that word is, and then averaged those scores across everyone who saw that particular word. I can't remember how many there are. I think there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of those words that have been tagged with average affect. On average, how positive or negative do people think that word is? What do you think is the, the what English word ha, is the most, has the most positive affect? What's the happiest word in the English language. Happy is a pretty good guess. It's up there. There are happier words than happy. Fantastic, Fantastic is up there. I, yep. Exuberant. Exuberant. Yeah, those kinds of words. I think triumphant is way up at the, might be number one, or it was. Uh, you can start to imagine what <laughs> words with the most negative affect are. Suicide, suicidal, Words like that have negative <coughs> affect. So they went through the garden hose every day. So each point here, I think they average this in this plot by week. So there should be 52 dots between each year here on the horizontal axis. All the tweets from the garden hose during that week, they took all of those tweets, broke it apart into its independent words, and looked for words that had these affect taggings and just averaged it across that entire week. So were people using happier or sadder words during that, that week? It's a huge amount of data, as you can imagine. And back before 2010, Professor Dodds and Danforth were thinking about how do you present this data in a way that people can see pattern in the data. And they came up with the odontometer. Hopefully, you can see some patterns in this data. What do you see? This is a little dated now. It ends at 2014. You can go to hedonometer.org, I think, and see the, the rest of the data. Every like, Christmas and New Year are spikes in happiness. Yes, right. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. That helps drive those points up. Happy and Merry have positive affect associated with them. Those are the positive outliers. What about the negative outliers? When is Twitter particularly sad? Deaths of celebrities. Deaths of celebrities, <laughs> yes. That will do it. Terrorist events, natural disasters, yes. Yes, right. Interesting, right? If you think about it, maybe it could have gone either way. Okay, yes? I mean, do we know, like, I mean, a lot of the people in my social circle were, like, actually pretty psyched about the death of a son. Do you think it, like, just measures the word frequency? I mean, people are saying death a lot, or he was killed. Do you think it just assumes that that means he's sad regardless of the context? Exactly. So is it because it's just sad of the context? So you can start to now form hypotheses about why these particular patterns exist, right? One of the great things about visualizations and interactive visualizations is you can form a hypothesis and then dive back into the data and visualize a different cut through the data to see whether the data supports your hypothesis or not. You might have a hypothesis for why the death of Osama bin Laden was so 
negative. You could click on that dot and expand it and start to dive in and look at pattern at a finer, finer temporal scale, right? By day, by hour, where, who was tweeting, and so on. Yes? Did you say that this was only in English they were doing this? Exactly. This is only in English, right? So now we're getting back to thinking about people, right? Who is captured in the Twitter garden hose? Okay, so there's some obvious patterns here you can see. They're even tagged for you, the positive and negative outliers. What other patterns can you see here? <coughs> Seems like everyone is sadder. It's time to... Yes, between 2009 to the left here and 2013 here, there was a gradual decline in the overall happiness of words that were captured in the Twitter garden house. And then it seemed to tick up a little bit. Any hypotheses about why that might be the case? Could be, yes, okay. Things were sad back here though, right, particularly. Could be the economy, what else? Twitter relate to growth of Twitter? Ah, now, right, we, we need to think about people, right? Who is, who is tweeting? What sort of demographic distribution existed in Twitter on Twitter in 2009 compared to 2013, right? So again, we can start to go in and look for pattern by looking at different aspects of the metadata. Who is tweeting? How long have they been using Twitter? What other social networks are they on? How often do they tweet? Who else do they follow on Twitter? And so on, right? Okay, again, just an example, but an example, in my opinion, of a great visualization because you can see pattern in there, and hopefully you start to form hypotheses about why those patterns might exist. You can dive back into the data and look for other explanations. Okay, um, throughout lecture six, we're going to be looking at a fair bit of work by Edward uh, Tufta. I'm going to pass around uh, his first book. We're going to talk about three of his books today and into Friday. This is one of my favorite books of all time, so please make sure to bring it up to the front at the end. You can leaf through uh, Tufta's book here. It has some fantastic visualizations. The reading for today is drawn from his latest book called Beautiful Evidence. And Tufta has written a number of books and articles about this issue of information uh, design. If you're interested in this topic in particular, I highly recommend uh, his books. Okay, so what do we do? We have a huge amount of data out there. Where do we start? Well, obviously, we have to simplify somehow, right? We can't, we can't draw the raw data from the, garden, uh, from the Twitter garden halls. There's just too much. We're going to have to throw some away which is obviously where things start to go wrong. What do you throw away? It depends on who you're making the visualization for and why are they looking at your visualization in the first place. Right? We've already encountered Tufta. He said maximize the data to ink ratio. Right? Throw away as much as you can given what the person wants to get out of your visualization. We probably need to systematize quite a bit. We need to clean up the data and make sure it's more or less in the same format. But again, that's going to cause us to throw some stuff away. Are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater? What data can we let go and what data can we not let go? On the flip side, obviously, we can't just draw the raw data, right? So we're always striking a balance in information design between simplification and abstraction and systematization and drawing as much data as we can to maximize the data part of the maximize ink to data ratio. One way to reconcile this trade-off is to try and use metaphors. And we've seen this already when we looked at some visual metaphors from the Gapminder project. Right? We can simplify things, but by making a metaphor between something that exists out in the world that's captured in the data, and a visual metaphor, something that's happening on the, the screen, right? So maybe you're creating a visualization of communicable diseases, and you'd like to help the user understand how AIDS spread around the world. You might draw on some metaphors, uh, you might draw on some metaphors about spread. Um, let me switch to the, uh, an example of this. 
from the reading. Uh, if you go through the reading, the first visualization in Beautiful Evidence is a visualization of the Napoleonic invasion of Russia. I apologize, it's split across two pages. Here's Napoleon's army marching to the right, and they eventually reach Moscow, and they start marching back. Without being able to read any of the details here, what does this visualization hopefully suggest to you, or make very clear? They're a really big army to start. Absolutely. Anybody who read War and Peace? This is War and Peace in two pages. You don't need the cliff notes. You just need this picture, right? Terrible attrition, right? It, it draws on a lot, it ties together a lot of things, right? The amount of attrition. It ties together space, so this is a visualization drawn on top uh, of a map. It doesn't quite capture time very well, but you get the basic, the basic idea. And there's this kind of visual metaphor that's behind this visualization. As something spreads, a liquid, as it spreads, it tends to thin out. Right? So there's something about the fact that Napoleon overstretched or overreached right, in this, this case. It would be an example of a visual metaphor here. We all know that if something <coughs> spills or starts to move, if it's a finite quantity, in this case military men, it will only take you so, so far. It will start to attenuate the further it goes from the source. Okay, so that's taking sort of a con an abstract concept, right, this military campaign, and helping you to understand how it actually played out in space and people power and time by drawing on this visual metaphor of something that spreads and attenuates over space. Okay, so you could use a visual metaphor like that in drawing a visualization of the spread of AIDS or the spread of an idea. How might you do it? If I gave you a whole bunch of data about uh, AIDS or a particular meme, and for each point of data in either of those data sets, you had the metadata of where and when, that's the raw data, how would you visualize it? How would you draw it? How? How would we put it on a map? Dots by population. Dots by population. Okay. You could draw uh, arrows of the, like the larger the arrow, I guess, going to a population from Africa to Europe, etc. Kind of how the big frogs around. Excellent. So great. First, first idea. Let's obviously draw something on a map. Maybe we're going to draw points, and the size of those points is the number of people infected with the disease or the idea. However, our observer is probably going to want to know how it spread over time, so we could start to add arrows, right? Infections here tended to cause infections over here. Now, how we pull out of the data where that arrow is and which direction it should point, that's a technical issue. But again, we're starting to build up a visual metaphor for presenting this kind of, of information. Okay. Again, we need to be careful that our observers get the metaphor. Right? You remember the example of the one laptop per child and the Wi-Fi tower that could be mistaken for uh, an exploding volcano? Make sure you get your metaphor right depending on your, your audience. Okay, so before we talk about some of the material from Tufta's book, we're going to go back to uh, Gapminder and we will finish today's lecture by watching one of the very first TED Talks, so this one's a little dated now, um, by Hans uh, Rosling, and he is the creator of Gapminder. Um, there's, it's a 20-minute talk, so we're going to do this in three seven-minute segments. As you, watch, uh, as you watch the video, I want you to take notes of what's going on. So I want you to take notes of the conceptual ob objects. So Hans Rosling is going to try and communicate to you in 20 minutes a lot of information about the relationship between health and wealth in different nations over time. And in order to do that, he's going to draw on gross national product, AIDS, education issues, number of children per woman, and so on. So there's going to be a lot of different conceptual issues. And I want you to note for each of those conceptual issues what 
visual component brought it to life, right? Population size is the size of the circle, right? We've already seen that before. Color of the circle is where that population lives in the world. There's going to be a lot more that you're going to see as you, as you go. Listen to how he talks about the data he presents. At one point, you're going to hear him talk about this visualization, and he's going to talk about China closing in on the United States, right? There's that metaphor of something that is overtaking something else, which you can see very clearly in the visualization. But at heart, he's talking about some <coughs> conceptual dynamics, which is the fact that the rate of improvement in the Chinese economy, at least up to 2004, was higher than the rate of economic improvement in the United States, right? A very abstract concept, but he grounds it in our experiences, right? There's two moving dots. They're both moving in the same direction. One is moving faster than the other. That means that suggests the affordance that this thing is going to overtake this thing. It suggests, it advertises this function, right? Overtaking. Okay, you'll notice also um, how he's a great show person and he uses this visualization to draw a good response from the crowd. So going back to our thinking about people and activities con and context, Rosling is gonna try and make some very powerful points about health and wealth in different countries given the audience that's at TED, right? So he knows his, his audience. Okay, here we go. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought, maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pre-test when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> But one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unfa unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. Uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. 
And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries. Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see. We stop the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. <laughs> Let me make a comparison directly between United States of America and Vietnam. 1964. America had small families and long life. Vietnam had large families and short lives. And this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families. And the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 80s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy and it moves faster even than social life and today we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam 19, 2003 as in United States 1974 by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia which was in social change before we saw the economical change. So let's move over to another way here in which we could display the distribution in the world of the income. This is the world distribution of income of people. One dollar, ten dollar or one hundred dollar per day. There's no gap between rich and poor any longer. This is a myth. There's a little hump here. Huh? But there are people all the way. And if we look where the income ends up, huh? The income, this is 100% of world's annual income, and the richest 20%, they take out of that about 74%, and the poorest 20%, they take about 2%. And this shows that the concept developing countries is extremely doubtful. We sort of think about aid, like these people here giving aid to these people here. But in the middle, we have most of the world population, eh? and they have now 24% of the income. We heard it in other forms. Eh? And who are, who are these, these? Okay. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm not going to play the, um, I'm not going to play the other two segments until next time. So let's just talk about this one for a moment. Comparison between Vietnam and the United States. He introduced a number of concepts in this <coughs> historical trajectory, which you can see visually in the data. What was it? What's the visual metaphor here? Look at the red line here of Vietnam. So this is how fertility rate on the horizontal axis versus life expectancy on the vertical axis, how health and wealth 
have changed in this particular country starting in 64 and going until 2003? What can you immediately see just by looking at this red line? Rates of progress. Rates of progress, right? So you can see change in these two variables over time. Let's go one step further. You can see that they're changing. How do they change over this time period? What pattern do you see in this red line? Absolutely, right? So we're obviously moving from here towards here, and there was a cultural shift, right? So there's a conceptual idea. Something happened in this country. Can we be a little bit more specific? Look at this red line again. Tell me about the shape of this line. When did these cultural, there were two cultural shifts, when did they occur? <coughs> During the war and after the war? During the war and after, yes, more or less. If you look carefully, you notice these inflection points, right? So the slope of the line here is relatively constant. And then something happened, 64, 74, some, somewhere around here, the 70s, something happened immediately so that the next year in Vietnam, there was a sudden difference in the relationship between these two variables, right? So a geometric property, this is the visual metaphor, is an inflection point. There was a sudden change in just one year. And if you look carefully, there's two of them. There's one inflection point and there's another one. What was the first one and what was the second one? He mentioned it in his talk here. Absolutely. So right here, this is when the communist regime fell in Vietnam, that year. I don't know what year it is, but you can figure it out by counting the, the dots, right? This was when women started to promote family planning. So rather than top-down bureaucracy, there were women in a lot of rural villages that were promoting this idea about managing the size of families. That policy was implemented but with, through help with the, from help with the United Nations and other groups and so on, and it was sudden. The impact was sudden. You could see it from one year to the next, right? So again, a visual metaphor, a <laughs> geometric change, these inflection points, and they correspond to two abstract concepts here, which was sudden cultural and political change in that country in those years, right? You can see it. Something happened in Vietnam in these two important years and you can go back and look up what it is. Okay, we'll continue on with parts two and three on Wednesday uh, of this, of uh, Rosling's talk. We have a quiz due tonight, and continue on with Deliverable 5. Thank you.